The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ben Nash here. I'm a co-founder at XY Advisor and founder of financial advice business Pivot Wealth. My business baby I started from scratch a bit over six years ago. In that time, I have leveraged some of the learnings of the XY community to scale the business and become one of the better known financial advice businesses for high income accumulators. You can join me each Tuesday as I have the privilege of interviewing some amazing people where I'll sell be able to uh, continue my personal journey to improve every aspect of my advice process and hopefully you can learn a few things on the journey as well. Jump over to xyadvisor.com if you haven't signed up already to share and learn from other advisors or simply download the app. This series is brought to you by Hub24, one of Australia's leading providers of integrated platform, technology and data solutions to the wealth industry. By working with licensees and advisors, Hub24 is delivering innovative solutions and service excellence that enables you to do business your way, creating efficiencies for your business and value for your clients. These are just some of the reasons why advisors have rated Hub24 number one for value for money and best managed portfolio functionality six years running, empowering better financial futures together. Find out more at hub24.com.au. Hey guys, Ben Nash from the XY Advisor team, and uh, today I'm uh, here with a great friend of XY Advisor, Vince Scully, coming back for your fourth, fifth appearance. Could be the fifth. Could be the fifth. At uh, least the fourth, if not the fifth. And uh, Vince also hosts uh, some streams of our XY content, but I'm keen to turn the microphone around and, uh, you know, pick this man's brain, Vince, if for anyone that's been living under a rock, is a founder and chief Sherpa at Life Sherpa, who are totally dominating uh, tech-led advice. Vince, great to have you here. It's great to be here, Ben. Well, it's actually great for you to have me well, here, that's seeing right, as we're you're sitting here, sitting in, here in our studio in here in North lovely Sydney studio with this lovely chair. Life, not, Life Sherpa blue chair. Life Sherpa blue. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not used to this level of comfort while I do my podcast, but anyway. Well, you know, this is the home of the finishing <laughs> set. <laughs> there we go. So look, uh, we've been chatting, uh, caught up actually for the first time since COVID, like just a, a couple of months back and had a few conversations. I was asking you how everything was going and was blown away to hear that you're just about cracked eight figures in revenue. I know just- uh, I had to count those, those <laughs> digits for a moment. Just marginally and short. And not counting the ones after the decimal point. That's right. Yes. Just uh, marginally short of that lovely, lovely $10 million mark. It's got such a nice ring to it. Uh, and how big is your team again? Well, it's a total team of nine, of which one, two, three, four are on the advice register. Does that, do you know where you compare to Apple? Because I know that they've got that thing where they've like across their business, they run a million dollars of revenue per employee. I'm not sure where that sits in the post environment. It's getting pretty, it's getting pretty close. Yeah, um, you're basically slightly neck different and neck. zip code. <laughs> slightly different. But that, that is amazing. Uh, I know that you've been on the podcast before and talked a bit about that, but I feel like, uh, you know, any advisor, myself included, it's like, that's like the holy grail. You've got basically four, um, four advisors on the advisor register and, and running that level of revenue. How on earth are you doing that? Um, well, it's, it's partly, well, mostly tech, but the thing po- that possibly differentiates it um, is we cover a broad range of services. So we do home loans as well. Mm-hmm. So when you look at where that revenue comes from, you know, probably a third of it is home loans, a third is insurance, and the rest is digital products. Subscription fees subscription and that sort of stuff. Fees, so you're yeah. basically charging a subscription fee, um, fee for service. You're doing things like rebating commissions on yep. insurances and home loans, membership yep. fee to lock them in, which I think is genius to um, to build up your member base. How many how many members or people are members? 3,700 and something at last count. Mm-hmm. Um, that That's – so someone – a membership is five hundred and forty-seven dollars a year, mm-hmm. which may sound like a strange number, but it's a dollar fifty a day, and it's 
just less than the magic $600 that um, ASIC reckons people will pay for it. So it was actually all deliberately priced to get under the view of what the consumer is prepared to pay for it. There you price. go. This is why I'm fighting an uphill battle telling our clients that it's $10,000 for their financial plan and you're just leaning into this $600 figure and coming in cheaper. Yeah, but it's a, I mean, it's, it's a very different business and quite deliberately so. Mm. Um, you know, when I talk to VCs and investors, they will say, well, you're disrupting financial advice. And they go, well, no, we're not. Um, we're not here to take business from Credit Suisse or Macquarie Private or any other face-to-face advice here because mm. what we're doing is something completely different. Yeah. It's still financial advice, but it's to an audience that would otherwise not not be buying financial advice, either because they don't recognize it, they don't trust it, advice is something their parents have, um, or they think it's not for them, or they're not prepared to pay more than 600 bucks. Mm. Um, and so we are about broadening the audience. And when we did our initial market research, there's 1.7 million households in the country who are an above average income from PAYG activities and are under 45. Mm. That's and a big number. It is. That's one in five households, which is about the same as the number of households who take advice today. So this is a, a cohort that's at least as big as those who currently take advice, mm. but they're not getting it. And um, there's a whole bunch of reasons for that. Um, yeah. And in my view, legislation is not one of them. <laughs> um, <laughs> but for most of them, they don't know that financial advi- advice is the answer to the problem they have. Yes. Because to the extent that they've seen financial advice, it's something their parents have done. Well, I think it's to, similarly with our clients, while it is a, a very different sort of cohort, it's the same same thing that we, you know, I for a long time have been and had some great coaches that have taught me that um, educating the the uninformed people, like if you're starting a business or you, you're launching a solution, it's like you could go and, and there's good business in certain areas for people specifically targeting those people that are seeking out financial advice. You know, you start advertising for keywords on Financial Advice Sydney and that sort of stuff. You've got people that are actively looking for a financial advisor, whereas the approach that I've always taken is let's uh, let's educate on what's possible with money and then create a, uh, a people realising that they they need this or that this could potentially benefit them. And then you've been there on that journey and then, you know, it, it assists with, uh, yeah. with conversion. But... It is it is different in some ways, but not in others. And I think we were just chatting a little bit offline that, uh, yeah, it it is a different market because for for an advice uh, for an advice business, there's not a lot of incentives for us to go and start launching a four hundred dollar a year solution. You know, for I don't us, exaggerate five forty seven, five forty seven. <laughs> sorry. Um, so yeah, because if an advisor is selling plans for Ten thousand dollars, five thousand dollars, three thousand dollars, even like they like you say that we've got one in five households buying, you know, the higher end financial <laughs> advice or like you know higher price point financial advice. Their advice businesses go well. There's a, there's millions of people there we, where we could expand that market. Are you really going to go cannibalize your clients by launching something that's you know at a significantly lower price point? Um, and I'm keen to talk about how you yep. built your solution, which I appreciate is not uh, something that you just do like a financial advice where you draw up a nice little process yeah. map and then go um, cold call a few people or do a bit of content marketing and get people through the door. But um, yeah, I, I think it is different. And I think like if we think about that affordability of advice and um, where things are going. I feel like, you know, obviously we've got this QAR happening. Mm -hmm. Um, It's talked for a long time about this glass ceiling of financial advice and then we're talking about diminishing advisor numbers and uh, all of these things. And, yeah, people people are, are looking at, well, what is the answer? And I think tech is the answer. I think you guys are doing it better than than most, if not all, people in this space. But if I, I think if I fast forward, and I've been saying this for some time, if you fast forward five years from now or 10 years from now, what does it look like? Well, it's sort of like what you guys are doing just with maybe a few more of those interactive yaks that you've got with your <laughs> animation. Yeah, I mean, I think you've got to be something. careful about um, techifying traditional advice. Mm. That most of what we do in advice is psychology. Mm. The technical... You know, investment management stuff is all all well and good. And it's obviously essential to it. But 
most of what we do is client psychology. So it's mm. about leading them to the solution. And if you want to have a a higher end consumer who's prepared who is looking for one on one therapy mm. over lengthy periods of time, then you can't really techify that without devaluing the price in their mind. Mm. So if if it's completely techified, then well, why wouldn't you buy it for five forty seven rather than ten yes, grand? Exactly. And um yeah, you know, so if I go back to my previous business, you know, my typical client was sixty five and had a million dollars mm. and paid me nearly thirty thousand dollars a year. Mm. Um but they pay that for their quarterly meeting, their tailored portfolio, yes. their you know, we did all the self managed super fund, we organized the audit and the tax return and all those sort of things. So mm. it was a true one stop shop, which is what they were prepared to pay for whilst they jetted around the world. Yeah. And I or think also, around the world. also what they need as well, because it's yes, it is psychology for sure and coaching and those sorts of things, but ultimately why why psychology, why coaching? Well, it's because what we're trying to do is we're trying to get people to take action, to take yeah. the action that they need to do to get the results that they want. And we know as advisors, it's like, what do people need to do to be successful with their money? Well, they need to invest. They need to invest more. They need to invest smart when we're facing market conditions like what we're seeing at the moment yeah. or like what we've seen over the last few years. But what do people do in those conditions? Well, they, they do what everybody else is doing and they shit themselves and they do nothing and then they miss opportunities and then they're um, missing results. Like, yes, sure, we come up with these awesome strategies that are really smart and save tax and do add, but ultimately it's like, you know, like I did the ton of content like you do as well. You invest. Oh, we still haven't cracked TikTok though. Invest, not yet. <laughs> not yet. Not yet. Although I'm scared for when you give it a nudge uh, based on your track record with the, with the other platforms. But I think like, you know, to be a multimillionaire, you just need to invest small and invest regularly and do that. But why do people not do it? Well, it's because they're fearful, because they because they don't have confidence. And I think that the more, yes, like you say, those, your old clients, the 60, 65 year old clients with a million dollar portfolio. Who would now be 85. <laughs> yeah. But they, and, and similarly for accumulators that are younger, that are working with really high salaries or significant <laughs> like uh, inheritance or, you know, employer share or whatever, like if they're making, if you're making a $5,000 decision, you need different inputs to get comfortable than if you're making a $50,000 decision or a $500,000 decision or a $5 million decision, it's different. So like there's probably a strong argument as awesome as your solution is that if you've got someone that's looking to invest $3 million, maybe they're not going to get the amount of confidence that they need to pull the trigger for um, a tech-led solution that that is there. And I think that they, they both solutions are important. They're great. They have their place. Absolutely. But, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I always maintain that there's only one thing we sell as advisors and that's confidence. Yeah. So confidence that I'm making the right decision today yeah. and confidence that I'll be okay. Yeah. And whatever client you work with, that's fundamentally what they're looking for. We yeah. call it lots of things. We call it an investment plan. We call it a budget. We call it a mm. cash flow forecast. We call it whatever it is. But ultimately it's about delivering Confidence. That's right. Because yeah. one thing we can't deliver is certainty. Yes. And what we need to do is be able to deliver confidence. Yeah. Clarity. And that leads to action and that leads to results and outcomes. And um, how you do that will depend on the, the client. And mm. yeah, there are millions of clients who are more than happy to pay five to ten thousand dollars to yes. get that in person. Yeah. And that's a different market. So these two mm. live quite comfortably side by side. But I think if you start putting too much client facing tech in the way, and I know people like Matt Hine, you're probably going to kill me for these sort of comments. <laughs> but um, if you put too much of that in front of a client who's willing to pay $10,000, you do run the risk that they go, well, actually, mm. do I really need to pay $10,000 if I'm not getting Ben sitting across the table from me? Mm. And I think if people can fall into the trap of thinking that they can do more themselves or that it's just about choosing good investments mm. or that it's just about doing these things, but we know that that's not the case. Yeah. But if they do, if they don't know that, then sometimes they can waste a whole bunch of time by thinking that and, and trying to do it and floundering mm. in the results. And I think everyone's seen those clients that they're doing things thinking that they're doing all of the right things and then you shine the light and it's like, hold on, what about this thing? And then you like discover a massive opportunity or a massive issue and it's like, well, that's where the, the money is and that's 
that's why we're here. But what's your take on, you know, with that, there's two potential streams of advice and they're talking about, you know, uh, affordability, we've got QAR, we've got tech, the rise of technology and the rise of the client and the rise of content. Like, wh- how do you see things playing out? From I mean, I've, I've always maintained that education is an important part of it getting to that level of confidence mm. that they either have to have confidence in you as an individual and that's what they're prepared to pay to sit across the table from you and have a cup of coffee or mm. a beer every quarter um, or they get comfortable that they know enough that you can do it with them and that's probably more what we said. So you know, mm. the things that go with confidence, you know, clarity, so what do I really want and capacity, that is the ability to make those decisions. So Mm. some people need more information to make those decisions. Some people will go, Ben, don't worry about it. You just tell me what to do and I'll do it. And But there are others who need comfort that you do know what's best for them Mm. and they can have confidence in that. And that's where technology has a role because, A, you can deliver the education. So rather than spending half an hour explaining to someone how insurance works, Mm. they can go and watch our animated yak explain it to them. (laughs) And um, before they come and visit the advisor, so that advice process then becomes one of fulfillment rather than one of education. Mm. But that's not cheap and query whether people are prepared to pay $10,000 for it. Yes. Whereas the one-on-one tailored delivery of that is something that people who have the money will pay for. Mm. And I think that's how I would distinguish between what we're doing and what the traditional advice business does. And that's not to say that we're creating a two-tier advice industry, Mm. which is sort of where the FSC white paper was going and where some of the QAR recommendations are going. If you want, mm. I mean, the FSC in particular was saying, well, here's how we're going to cut the cost of advice. We're actually going to remove all the consumer protections from mm. younger, poorer clients and keep the protections for older, wealthier clients. Yeah. And this notion of simple advice is really a recipe to discourage people from taking it. If it's really that simple, why do I need to advise it? Yeah. Um, there is no such thing as simple advice. It's, mm. It might be simple technically. But it's still the same psychology exercise. Yeah. There's no difference really between investing fifty thousand, investing fifty million. Um, mm. And there's the, an argument I think that with when you're working with people that are, you know, on the average income below average income, that they've it's more important. Well, is it more important for them to get it right? But it's just it's well, definitely more to them. Definitely <laughs> just as important because they're not going to have any uh, take two. Like if they realise six years from now that they've they've gone down the wrong path, it's going to be harder for them that's to right. unwind. Whereas you've got someone that's saving ten or twenty grand a month. Well, they can go. Okay, well, that was a bad decision. I'm going to I'm going to close that off, and then now I'm just going to keep smashing this other thing, which is going to be a good idea and get me the, the so, result. So, getting a 29 year old who doesn't own their home and is spending everything they earn to save thousand dollars a month mm. will make a much bigger difference to their life than making 50 basis points extra for my old 70-year-old <laughs> retirees. Yes, that's um, true. Because they won't notice the extra 50 basis points, mm. and they probably won't thank you for it if it, <laughs> if it means that they lose 2% more in the next downturn. Yes. But you know, the biggest difference you can make to someone's life is to get them onto that, um, mm. onto that path, and there's a whole audience that doesn't have $6,000 to pay for that. Yes. And so how do we deliver that service to them without it being a second-rate service? Mm. And so do you think in the future, do you see there being more companies like Life Sherpa, like offering it at this sort of market at that sort of level? Uh, I'd be very surprised if there weren't. Um, The challenge is um, who's got an incentive to solve this problem? I mean, mm. I think everyone in the industry recognises that affordability of advice is a problem. Yes. Or lack of affordability of advice is a problem. Mm. But when you look at the players with the money to fix the problem, very few of them actually have an incentive to fix the problem. Mm. So the obvious players in this space are the big super funds. Yes. Because they have every adult Australian as their customer. So there's 24 million 
Superfund accounts in the country, mm. 16 million adults, 30 million taxpayers. And, you know, if you look at the big six super funds, they have, I don't know, 60% of those. Mm. And they're the ones who've got the, mm. the capacity to fix it. But is it really in their interest to fix it? Mm. Why do you think they're well, not? Well, because they well, might change their super fund? Yeah. Well, would a, would a, um, super, would a well advised 29 year old, choose one of the my super balanced funds from the big funds mm. yeah probably not i'm mean, given that asset allocation is the number one driver of outcomes yeah um you know should you really be buying a balanced fund that you can't actually determine what the asset allocation is yeah um to solve that problem mm. so that's a that's a big challenge and you know taking the fsc approach of a two-tier system is very un-australian yes so who's going to do this do the big dealer groups have a big incentive to do this? I, don't, I wouldn't be banking on them necessarily for the future because I think the dealer groups are under a lot of pressure mm. at the moment. And like, where does that business model with the move to self-license, like the strong move to self-license advice practices, where it seems to sort of be heading? Um, well, that's a bit of a fashionable thing. Mm. Like in the pre-GFC period, like in the 2000s, there was a bit of a rush to boutique, smaller licensees, mm. and it sort of drifted back post-GFC where the brand actually meant something to the consumer. Oh, yeah. And now we're seeing it drift the other way. So mm. I don't know whether that's a permanent shift. Um, there's still only 2,000 licenses in the country. Yeah. Well, I think, though, that as the, the PI costs seem to increase considerably when you've got multiple office firms and then multiple business firms as well because the compliance processes, it's harder to run a consistent com compliance approach that fits for a whole bunch of businesses. Yeah. And the more businesses you've got, the harder it is to make that fit. And, and that adds a lot of cost, yeah. especially when you're trying to overlay on that a desire for or you, a desire to use advisors as distribution. So if you are a product manufacturer, mm. yeah, regardless of what the the law and the individual advisors is there's still a strong incentive to sell your licensees products. Mm. Um, yeah, best interest duty notwithstanding. Of course. Um, and so that creates a much more expensive compliance environment. Mm. Whereas if you start with the actually what is in the best interest of the client, yes, and then work from there, compliance becomes sort of easier. Mm. And that's probably where the tech takes the biggest cost out of our business. Yeah. Is that no matter who you talk to here, you get the same methodology. Mm. So the same set of circumstances will give you the same outcome every time. Yeah. Now, it's not to say that everyone gets the same outcome, but given the same set of circumstances, you should always get the same outcome. Yes. That if you get a different outcome, that's actually a QA problem and that's a compliance problem waiting to happen. Yes. And we all know that it's the outcome's often a function of the biases that an individual advisor brings to the table. Yes. And there's a lot of academic research supporting this. Oh, I'm not, I'm oh, not yeah, making yeah, this yeah. up. You don't need, you can have um, anecdotal research. So, that... so this is not me just making this up or using it as an excuse. But if you give the same set of circumstances to five different advisors, you'll probably get five different answers. Yes. As it should be. But when you have it within a practice or within a license, you know, how mm. do I manage that? Yes. And that's where a lot of the tech came from. So you have know, XPlan, mm. Coin gives, you know, through the templates and the dealer group login and oversight of revenue, starts mm. to give you a bit of a picture about what's happening on, happening in a practice. Yes. But it's really expensive. Mm. And even still then, it doesn't really necessarily drive consistency in client outcomes because – like I know for us in uh, at Pivot, like we have we hire advisors that are all sort of broadly aligned from a advice philosophies perspective, mm. but we have to spend a lot of time focusing on it. Okay, well, what actually makes sense for these clients? Like, what what would you do? And the, the how I used to um, sort of tell advisors to tackle those decisions is to say, I want you to imagine that it was you. If you're in that exact situation and you, you know, you have X dollars in the bank and you have X dollars in property and you have X dollars in debt and then you're grappling with this decision, what would you do in that circumstance? But what I realized in asking people that question is that 
it depends on the person. Yeah. It depends on their In many ways, it's the wrong question mm. that may lead you to the right answer, but yes. it's possibly the wrong question. And so the way we approached it and the way we built the tech was to say, if I have this set of circumstances, like if I picture a box with a you know, 20 dimensions or whatever it is, mm. you know, the number of circumstances that put someone in that box. Now, what's the solution for that box? Yeah. So now my advice process is actually working at which box this customer fits in. Mm. There might be hundreds or even thousands of boxes. Yes. But every customer fits into, or every customer that's within our universe will fit in one of those boxes. So the advice process is, first of all, is this person within the universe of boxes that I've got solutions for? Mm -hmm. If they're not, then... We, need we either box. build a new one or we need to reject them as customers. Yes. And we do that. So we don't do self-made super funds. We don't do family trusts. We don't do individual stock picking. Mm -hmm. So if you want one of those. You have to go to Pivot Wealth. You've got to go to Pivot Wealth. <laughs> um, or one of the other 15,999 advisors. I don't know. Pivot, pivot, <laughs> pivot Wealth. Um, <laughs> and so once you've worked out that they're in the universe, now all you've got to do, your advice process is about working out which box they're in. And once you've worked out which box they're in, then you've got the solution. Yes. So your quality control is actually built into that process. Mm. And I think the technical challenge that most other people who've tried this is actually trying to solve for every possible outcome on the fly. Mm. So if you try and build a solution while you're investigating the client circumstances, mm. you create this massive sequence of decision trees. Yes. Whereas you've actually said, look, here's the, the few hundred boxes, yes. a few thousand boxes that we have a solution for. Mm. Now, is this person in that universe? And mm. if so, then box 693 is their answer. Mm. And that makes sense. actually takes a huge amount of research. So maintaining that yes. is a big job. No doubt. And yeah. it means you need to have big flows coming in this side. If you try to you know, solve for all these boxes, and you've got 20, 30, 40 clients a year turning up. Yeah. That's too expensive. Yes. But if you've got you know, a few thousand clients turning up, yes. that's the difference. pre doing the answers and building it into the tech is how you, how you get that cost down. Mm. But it does mean you've got to identify your, your niche. As our American yes. friends say, the riches are in the niches. Yeah. Um, and so we were very clear about who our audience was. You know, mm. And or above average income, PAYG, in the workforce, and generally younger. Mm. As you can tell, that most people in in the workforce are younger than me. <laughs> but um, that generally means they're going through three of life's big changes, which I call coupling, nesting, and parenting. Mm -hmm. And that triggers a whole bunch of financial needs. Yeah. Yeah. So starting to deal with money as a couple. Mm -hmm. So we start with a. We have a pre-marriage course that deals with um, all of those Same sort of it. things. Yeah. Um, they're paying off debts. They're putting a budget together. They're saving to buy their first home. They're dealing with um, yeah, taking time off to have, have a baby. They're dealing with investing for the kid. And they probably have very large home loans, relatively, mm. and very limited assets and a long time to retirement. So they got a big requirement for, for risk insurance. Mm. And risk insurance and home loans is two thirds of the fees and commissions paid for financial advice in the country. So um, mm -hmm. yeah, let's not underestimate the size of this market. Totally, I um, I'm sure. Like looking at the stuff that you guys have done, I feel like obviously you're kicking butt. So I don't know how much you'd change, but like if you were to go back to to day one and do things differently, what would you change? Um, I mean, we've learned a lot along the way. I mean, the life shape of today is not the life shape of 2014. Mm. Um, you know, I started this journey actually in about 2010. I think I probably told this story before, but I had sold my previous business and um, I was sort of retired for the second time. <laughs> and I I came to I had this realization that this financial planning business it can't be rocket science. There's mm. got to be a formula here that you know we do stuff because that's how we've always done it, or that's. Yeah. There's a process we go through. And so I actually built this algorithm on paper 
on the wall of my off- office at home. So these mm. big A0 pages stuck all over the wall with this little flow chart on it. Mm. But I couldn't work out how to either implement it or make money out of it. So I sort of forgot about it for some time. <laughs> and then in 2014, the tech had sort of improved and um, I'd worked out how to make money. But the business back then was very, very different. And so, yeah, it would have been great to be able to skip over those five years of trying Mm. to get to probably 2018. It's been relatively settled, although growing, since about 2018. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, still trying to solve the challenge of, or the biggest challenge is, you know, getting... um, Sophia Avatar, yeah, so she's got a professional creative job. She wakes up on her 29th birthday and goes, you know, I've got a, I've got a good job. How come I'm not getting ahead? Mm. And why can't I afford a house? To go from that realisation to, oh, actually, I need to see a financial advisor when Sophie probably doesn't know what a financial advisor is. Mm. She certainly never had an advice relationship before except maybe an accountant who did her tax return. Mm-hmm. And so you've got to create the the knowledge or the insight that financial advice is the solution to that problem, Sophie. Mm-hmm. She, she's got a problem, but she's not Googling financial advice near me. No. Um, and But she's got this, yeah, what the Germans call Torschutz panic, which mm-hmm. is the fear of doors closing. So it's like a, okay. a midlife crisis type concept. Uh-huh. And so at on the nine, so 29, 39, 49, yeah. um, are years that create that sort of panic. Fuck, I've got one of those coming up. Um, and that's why marathon runners are overrepresented in those nine years. Is that right? Yeah. So if you actually look at the ages of people who run marathons, yeah, there are peaks yeah. in the nines. Okay, I'll have to suss that because out. Because that's what we do. So yeah. what, what would Sophie do today? She'd ask her parents. Yeah. And what got them there ain't going to get her there. No. Because the world's changed. Mm. And... She doesn't know what financial advisors do. And since most people who talk about financial advice talk about investment advice, Mm. she doesn't have any money to invest. Mm. So she doesn't need an investment advisor. Yes. But she needs someone to help her with her finances. Mm. And she needs to discover that that's the answer. So what would you do differently? um, Well, I think we've... Yeah, you know, we got closer to that messaging now, but that's okay. the big challenge. I still don't think we've cracked it perfectly. But Maybe the yak will do it. Though. Maybe the yak will do it. <laughs> Manny the yak. <laughs> um, because that's the, you know, she could have a yak to her Sherpa. Mm-hmm. Um, so do you think you would have focused more on on that, on yeah, solving that? I mean, I sooner. think getting the, get your, so for when someone rocks up your, so she wakes up on a 29th birthday or gets engaged or mm. has a baby or, yeah, you know, all these life events, those three in particular, she knows she's got a problem with her money, but what's the answer? Mm, maybe and TikTok. TikTok may very well be. And that's a good, you know, so that's where, you know, if she's not getting it from her parents, she's getting it on social. I can only hope. And um, the more people um, who are spreading the word that advice is available mm. and it suits people like her, um, the better. So that's why we love influencers at Life <laughs> Yeah. And so we are you know, in the business of licensing. Finfluencers. I know, yeah, you've got Victoria Devine. So Is Glenn James at Sort Your Money at um, My Millennial Money. Mm-hmm. Uh, Victoria Devine at She's on the Money. Invest with Queenie. Mm. Um, Maybe we need to chat. <laughs> so, <laughs> I want to be part of the Cool Kids Club. So we are, um, yeah, that's not so much a lead gen or marketing tool, but it's about building this education piece mm. and, you know, a network of creators. I mean, you've been to FinCon in the US. I mean, yeah. If you just think about the power of those networks in delivering the message to that, like, it's mm, okay to suck at huge. money. Yeah. No one's ever taught you how to do it. Yes. Um, so here's how you can do that. Mm. And without falling into the get rich quick crypto mm. MLM or, or just beating yourself up because yeah. that's the other part that people think that they especially like we work with so many people and they're super smart cookies they're you know work with a lot of people in tech coders sales 
great with people, great technically, um, super switched on, but then they feel super dumb when it comes to money. And then I think because they're high achievers already, then they they feel even more reluctant mm. to go and seek out support to help them make their decisions. And it's like they think, oh, I should be good with this because – you know, it's just money and I get paid every month. So, it's, you know, it should be easy, but it's not easy. And that's why this whole industry exists. And uh, I think the more people that have got that message out there saying, yeah, it is okay. And yeah, we're all in the same boat. Like just, we've just been doing it for a little bit longer. Let's talk about it together. I that's think. right. And calling it financial literacy is probably making the problem worse um, mm-hmm. because of, because being functionally illiterate, you know, not being able to read or write, it's a really shameful thing for a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So to say, well, you're financially illiterate sort of implies that you didn't pay attention at school uh-huh. or you're a bit yeah. a bit dumb. Hmm. Whereas, so we always talk about money skills, so developing better money skills. Mm-hmm. Money education, is that or, okay? Well, yeah, money education. But the use of the word financial literacy, which is very common among hmm. you know, government and um NGOs trying to work in this space, yeah, um, which I, which creates more shame around mm. money. I never thought about that, but that actually does make a lot of sense. That one's I'll have to ban that one from the vocab. So not that I use it a lot. So but. we don't use financial literacy here. And the other yeah. word that's banned from the vocab here is the word wealth. Yes. All of our Shit word. Um, all of our fa- focus groups at the beginning said, you know, we don't have wealth. We might have money. We might have assets. We mm. might have resources. Our yeah. parents have wealth, yeah, but we don't. Yeah. And what's the industry done over the last 15 years? Wealth We've management. rebranded everything. We yeah. went from funds management to wealth management. Yeah. We went from insurance to wealth protection. Yeah. And we yeah. have a whole generation who just don't doesn't it, like do the that. word wealth. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. we've got to get focused on our consumer here. Mm. That's funny. I was uh, I created one of these silly distractions that I involved myself in at some point was creating this course on savings, which I never really launched. Um, but anyway, that's a whole nother story. But when I was doing it, I did some research and because we were always talking to a lot of people, like new inbound inquiries and stuff, the, I just I just asked like 20 people if I could just ask them, you know, five minutes worth of questions at the end of our initial sort of discovery phone call. And I had these questions queued up and asked them about, because it was about cash flow, this cash flow course. And uh, I was like, what do you, like, what do you call it? You call it cash flow or like, what do you call it? And they're like, oh, no. Nah. Never, never cash flow. They're like money. That's my money. You know, that's uh, my money, my cash, cash maybe. My you know? Yeah, yeah. But I think we, and I think any industry is the same, but um, you get, you talking about it in the jargon and then you're just ingrained in that jargon that it's hard to step away from it. And I still, I think the last piece of really negative feedback that I got on one of our workshops, this, this is a, a while ago because I, it could be because my workshops are awesome, which is what I'd like to think, but it could mm-hmm. be because I don't do them in person and mm-hmm. hand out feedback forms anymore. But um, they they said too much jargon and I was like, what the hell? So I had to, I called this lady up and I was like, look, I was like, really appreciate the feedback. I just, um, I feel like I really need to understand this mm-hmm. because I was like, I put so much thought into trying to de-jargon. And she said that I kept referring to blue chip shares and she didn't know what it meant. So I was like, shit, because it's like, and it's so easy. Like, I, I feel like I'd stripped out so much stuff yeah. from the things, but some things you just sort of just like wrongly assume that the people just know that and they just don't. And then you throw those terms around and then people are sitting there thinking that they're the dumb one. Yeah. But, and people won't put their hand up and go, what do you mean, Ben? Mm. Um, because of this shame that, that, you know, in, I mean, even when I was a teenager, which you know, so a few years ago, <laughs> um, life was a lot simpler in terms of money. You got paid cash mm. and you spent cash. When the cash was gone, you stopped spending. Yeah. And then we discovered credit. Yeah. You know, so suddenly you've got a credit card. I went to uni. Bank was handing out credit cards like there was no tomorrow. Yeah. And so suddenly I had a 3,000 pound credit limit. And that was a year's fees in those days. So let's, you know. Yeah. And whereas today, I mean, when was the last time you had a note in your in your hand? I got one right here, Vince. Oh, a green one. <laughs> I like cash, although I don't really spend it. It mm. just sits there as an ornament. Yeah. Well, I've been to a time. teller machine twice since COVID began. Yeah. And um, both of those were went to the US and you just get some cash because yeah. they don't do credit very well. But debit is fine. I spend on debit. I got my thing on the Apple Pay, my CBA everyday yeah. transaction account. That's yeah. not a financial product device, by the way, but <laughs> uh, whatever that is, the CBA everyday account, and I put... 
I don't know, like 300 bucks a week goes into that account and that's my beer money and my pocket money and uh, that's it. Uh, that's my yeah. guilt-free spending. Yeah. I don't feel I mean, that wasn't, that wasn't a comment on the goodness or badness of credit. I don't have mm. a particular problem with credit, but it's just changed the way we deal with with money that it's no longer something physical yes. that you get your pay, pay packet at the end of the month yes. and it's got notes in it yeah. and when they're gone, they're gone. Yes. Whereas today, it's all just numbers in a ledger yeah. somewhere. Mm-hmm. And so we don't have the same sense of reality when it comes to money. Mm. Um, you know, I'm not particularly anti-credit. Um, and I certainly hardly ever spend cash, like tap, 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 tap. And you yeah. go through my credit card statement, mm. and they nearly all begin with LIV or SQ because they're all cafes. <laughs> <laughs> and um, But it's just changed the way we feel about think about money yes and the way we behave and the way we behave and mm. of course if you don't have very much money you know precisely how much a loaf of bread and a liter of milk costs mm. so people who are on the bread line don't need budgeting lessons yes they just need more money yeah um, yeah whereas people with good incomes yeah. whatever that might mean but you know average or above incomes yeah um and you know, your clients they don't need more money they need Education around how to manage to be able to get more life from their money. Mm. It's almost like you need to live the life that you want. With, with the, the money, money you have. <laughs> you should write a book about that. <laughs> um, but that, that's why I call the book that. that yeah. you know, when you see a lot of personal finance books, including the most popular, yeah. you know, what all they say is you know, avoid credit, spend less than you earn, Get a side hustle. Mm. Um, well, actually, if you had the skills to get more from what you've got, in most cases, you'd be better off spending the time doing something that you love rather than driving Uber on a Friday night. Mm. Yeah, and I think everybody could get a little bit more from what they have, and then you can get a little bit more and a little bit more. Yeah. And uh, that's especially for young people. It's like you lock in your behaviours, and then you've got, and then the future happens. And so long as you've got the good behaviours, they serve you well. But the sooner you, you do yeah. it, then but once you go bends, you never go back. Once you go what? Once you go bends, you never go back. Once mm. you turn left, you never want to turn right again. Mm. So getting these habits right at the beginning yeah makes a difference so unlearning that in your 40s is pretty hard it's hard yeah it's funny because our business and our clients have evolved a lot over the last seven years and when i first started the business we were working with a lot of people around sort of average income or probably like slightly above um and focused heavily on coaching and then over time the business got more like really high income clients and it's funny because we've got this cohort of people that they created these behaviors and then stayed long-standing clients and they're saving more money on a household income of 250,000 mm. than another household on 750,000 yeah. and it's like who's living better here like these people might buy more expensive things but really these guys are probably living a slightly better yeah. life really they're certainly going to be more happy in, in what they're doing even though they don't have that stuff so and you look at you know you look at you know professional couple with three kids at private schools that's a huge spend, mm. and I only had one, but yeah, I think the year he graduated, year twelve, was the biggest pay rise I'd ever had. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. I'm getting, uh, I'm putting out a few client stories on TikTok at the moment, and a lot of people are going, "What you mean? People earn that much, and they're only saving that much?" And I'm like, "Yeah, but when I look at their budget, I'm." There's not like they're wasting money on things that you just go, oh, there's, you know, immediately 20000 or 30000 or $40,000 of savings. It's like living is expensive and, you know, you've got to do that. But making sure, again, those those behaviours are in early means that as the, as the income goes up, then you actually profit. Whereas mm-hmm. if you don't, then you just get more and you spend more. Yeah. And that's also one of, you know, one of our philosophies and, and the core of the book really is to say that, um, you know, Success or failure with money is not not your morning latte, mm. but there are sort of a handful of big decisions that if you get them right, the rest sort of falls in place. And that's what most of our advice is around. So yes. the you know, where you live, what you drive, mm-hmm. how you prefer for the unexpected, how you prefer for retirement, yeah, how you make a living, and who you marry. If you get those decisions right, mm. um, it really doesn't matter how many coffees you drink. 
what you do with your kids, I think, is one of them. And I'm yeah. sure that that's in there. But um, yeah, and I mean, where you live come does drive that a lot. So if you, you know, if you live in a, a neighbourhood where all your neighbours' kids are going to private schools and they're going to ski camp in the <laughs> snowies, um, it just affects how you feel about a lot of things mm. and how they feel. Um, Absolutely, yeah. You know, I grew up in a very comfortable middle class existence in a uh, very good suburb of Dublin, and I always thought we were poor. Mm -hmm. Whereas it was only relative to the people around me. I mean, we lived well. Yes, we never wanted for anything, but you know, a lot of the boys I went to school with were um, a lot wealthier. Than yeah, us. yeah, but, it's sort of um, what you're exposed so to. So, what it, those sort of things do drive a lot of these behaviours. Mm, absolutely. And it comes back to the psychology thing. Yeah, and making conscious choices, I think, as well. But look, I'm sure we could talk about that client mm. stuff all day, but uh, maybe that's time for another podcast. My last question for you, what are you guys focused on now? What's coming up? Um, the um, That's a really good question, Ben. Um, I mean, there's a lot of constant tweaking of stuff. Um, from a content perspective, we've... Um, Starting Manny. now, to, Manny's coming. Manny's, up. Manny the X coming along, but that's more about focusing on content outside the paywall. Mm -hmm. So most of the work we've spent on content so far has been in terms of you know, starting with product, so group coaching courses, all that sort of webinars, all that sort of content stuff that mm -hmm. people are paying for, and what we call navigational content. So that's the content that guides people through the process so that when you book a, when you book a call with an advisor, um, you'll get a, an email that says, you know, thanks for booking a call with Justin. Um, here's what's going to happen in the meeting. In the meantime, you want to watch this video so that when you get to that meeting, mm. that client's prepared. And all that stuff is about shaving minutes off those calls. Efficiency, yeah. So like every minute of those call is $3 <laughs> and you just keep spending. Um, yeah. So we're absolutely focused on um, that whole time and motion stuff. Yeah. So if we can do a video that takes a minute of every discovery call, yes. then that's something that's worth doing. Um, and now we're starting to focus on content outside the paywall. So you'll see a lot more on um Maybe even TikTok, but certainly um, <laughs> YouTube um, podcasts um, and working with our creators. Um, so I'm definitely focusing on the growing our network of creators who operate under our license. Mm. And then probably the biggest thing that we, we just launched it this year is our corporate program. So we're offering a uh, corporate financial wellness program mm -hmm. where your employer for three ninety nine can deliver it all you can eat financial advice for their employees, including a whole bunch of onboarding and webinars mm -hmm. tailored to their salary packaging and share schemes and stuff. I think I've just found the theme for our next podcast. Vince, yes. So, well, that corporate financial wellness. Let's see how it's I going. Could, uh, that, I mean, that's becoming a huge deal in the US. Yeah. Um, in the US, it's largely paid for out of the health insurance budget, which mm -hmm. is you know, 20, 30 percent of payroll. Yeah. We don't have that problem here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the stuff that was getting paid for out of the corporate super trials um, just, Not so much. just doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. So, and the employer is the natural place, your, the workplace is the natural place to do this because mm. your employer is in your pocket. You know? mm. They're the main source of your income. They're generally the source of your super. Many provide insurance. Many are providing salary packaging. So, you know, should I salary package my car? Should I, you know, all these mm. decisions that given that most of the providers have, are incentivized to sell car leases, which is where most of the money in salary packaging comes from, mm. where do you get advice that's in your best interest? I was almost about to say independent advice, but I can't say <laughs> that. Um, you know, all of that stuff's getting more complex with super stapling mm -hmm. because, um, and we see this with a lot of the big law firms where they provide very generous auto acceptance insurance to their employees. Mm. And so when you – but you've got to be in the staff super fund yes. to access it. Mm. And so previously, given that most people didn't make an election, they were defaulted into the corporate scheme and therefore got the insurance. Whereas now with super stapling, 
all these young graduates who worked in hospital or in retail while they've been at uni, all coming in with a, a rest or a host mm. super fund and getting stapled to it. And how does HR have that discussion? It's really hard. Mm. Well, I think that on the financial wellness side, the employers have got the most to gain with, uh, I was just looking at a piece this morning, like cost of lost productivity in the Absolutely. workplace because of financial stress, like $66 yes. billion or something. Well, so financial stress is the number one cause of stress in under 45s in Australia. Mm. Workplace stress comes a long way down the list for most people. Yeah. Mm. Well, I look forward to that conversation, Vince. Well, let's it's do awesome that. to see you uh, kicking goals, mate. And I look forward also to hearing about what $10 million feels like next time we <laughs> We might actually get there. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, mate. Great to have you here. Great to be here. Thanks, Ben. Cheers, guys. We'll catch you next time.